from high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where how many of you hit an inside the park grand slam when you were 37? Okay, fine, Ty Cobb, but you sit your ass down, you had your video last week, and God bless you, Brett Butler, for being the veteran outfielder whose inexplicable cartoonish misplay of what should have been a one-hop, one-run single enables us to always have the video of Tony Gwynn hitting an inside the park grand slam at the age of 37. And also, goddammit, God bless the idiot in the stands who tried to interfere with a fair ball but failed to make the play because he's a Dodger fan and thus a hopeless, useless dipshit. And with all the God blesses out of the way, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the Blast Radius, temporarily renamed for one night only as Tony Gwynapalooza, and which also precedes next week's program, which will be temporarily renamed The Night the Host Turns 50 and You Get to Shove Dollar Bills in His Internet Thong. Isn't that exciting? Jim Neagle has, has even threatened to install a stripper pole, if you can believe it. But before we get to the gwinning, and there will be much gwinning, make no mistake about that, we must first conduct our regular business. And hence, here is your decline of Western Civilization News Roundup for the second work week of June 2024. Dateline Brussels, Monday, 10 June. The climate change, zealots, social justice, lunatics, and globalist kleptocrats who have grown quite habituated to being the dominant, nay, hegemonic force in European Union politics in recent decades were dealt a very painful dick punch earlier this week when the EU Parliament elections were pretty much swept all the way from Dublin to Sofia by conservative and center-right candidates. And yes, as you might expect, there was much sky-screaming and rending of garments from the establishment fake news media in a wide variety of countries and a wide variety of languages. To hear them tell it, and you already know this, there are only two types of politician. There's the kind who has all the correct opinions, and there's the kind who's a dangerous right-wing extremist and probably secretly loves Nazis. If you're a centrist, just a middle-of-the-road every man with an average set of opinions about the world, that means you want to castrate children, ban the internal combustion engine, and make people eat bugs. Anything to the right of that, and, and you're basically indistinguishable from Mrs. Schickle Gruber's little boy. And they describe you with words like firebrand, controversial, that they never ever apply to people who are on their own team, and it's not difficult to see why a conservative sweep of the MEP elections would cause such paroxysms of sheer white-knuckle terror in the halls of European globalist douchebaggery, because the way this normally works is, conservatives mostly don't even run for seats in the EU Parliament because only globalist liberals think there should be an EU Parliament in the first place. And everything about the place is run by globalist liberals for the benefit of globalist liberals. The EU Parliament is one of the most magnificent bureaucratic cathedrals that the European globalist left has ever erected to itself. So when people who aren't globalist liberals start running for those seats and then winning them in not insignificant numbers, that can portend nothing but certain doom for the whole rotten institution, don't you think? And if you find yourself asking, wait, what difference does it make if populist conservatives take over a legislative body that only exists to serve the interests of the globalist left? Well, here's the answer, and I'm glad you asked. Because the best of all possible outcomes here is the populist right gaining a sufficient majority that the EU parliament votes to disband itself. The people who want to prop up this rotten, corrupt edifice, they know that's one possible endgame if this trend should persist unabated, or even quite possibly, if it accelerates. And it, boy, does it scare them shitless, which, in the opinion of this reporter, is a good and proper thing. Dateline, Washington, Tuesday, 11 June. In a story that proves the old axiom, never become such a raging egomaniac that you decide to shoot a documentary about yourself, HBO has provided footage to congressional investigators of Nancy Pelosi casually remarking that, yeah, it totally was her call to not deploy the National Guard to the Capitol on 6 January 2021. Strangely, surprise of all surprises, this particular bit of footage never came to light during the proceedings of the fake January 6th committee, even though that fake committee, its members handpicked by Nancy Pelosi herself, did subpoena other footage from the daughter slash filmmaker of this particular HBO thingy, Alexandria Pelosi. Alexandra or Alexandria? I don't know. Fuck it. Who cares? But the only um, the only footage 
They subpoenaed that time with stuff that made Nancy Pelosi look awesome. And this newest stuff is only becoming public knowledge now due to a more comprehensive subpoena that was issued by the Weaponization Committee. If this shit wasn't actually real, could you ever make it up? Hell no, you could not. And ultimately, does it tell us anything we didn't know already? Not really. Pelosi has claimed all along, falsely, that it was Trump's job to mobilize the National Guard. But that's always been a provable lie. The Speaker of the House is the Commander-in-Chief of the D.C. Militia. The President is not. If the President wants to mobilize any National Guard unit, he has to federalize it first. In Washington, D.C., just like in any state, it doesn't work any different in the district than it does in freaking Wyoming. But then that's not the real question, is it? The real question is, why was the National Guard needed at all? Why wasn't there a less inept response from the Capitol Police on the day in question? And it's a fair question to be sure. And remind me again, who is the Commander-in-Chief of the Capitol Police? Oh, that's right. It's also the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Are there lessons to be learned from the events of January 6th? You bet your sweet ass there are. And lesson number one is... Our federal district has a really indefensibly stupid system of government that very desperately needs to be changed. Any system that makes Nancy Pelosi responsible for coordinating a coherent and effective law enforcement response is intrinsically flawed in its basic conception. The framers of our constitution got many, many things right, and that was not one of them. And I am sure that Paul Pelosi would agree. I mean, I've heard of staying home to get hammered, but this is ridiculous. Dateline Brentwood, Wednesday, 12 June. The 30th anniversary of O.J. Simpson killing his ex-wife and her friend passed this week with seemingly nary a mention from anybody in the news media. So maybe they got it all out of their system when the juice kicked the proverbial carton just six or seven weeks ago. And it's too bad, really, because I, I was I was so hoping for the guy in his in his quest to to apprehend the real killer, and he never gave up either. Right up until the end, he was searching every golf course and titty bar in all of God's creation, trying to find the elusive Colombian drug dealer who did that awful thing. Well, when he wasn't in prison, at any rate. But you know how it goes. And I have no doubt also that Hunter Biden is going to display a similar, similarly dogged determination as he searches to the ends of the earth for the Mexican gangbanger, that dastardly bastard who stole his gun and threw it in the trash dumpster by a school and, and, and framed the president's perfectly innocent son for the crime. So what have we learned in the 30 years since O.J. Simpson killed his ex-wife and her friend? Most importantly, we have learned that sometimes the exigencies of social justice politics demand that verdicts in criminal t trials sometimes not be con connected in any way to the question of whether the defendant actually did the thing, if indeed there ever was a crime at all. And I think Officer Derek Chauvin and President Donald Trump can tell you all about that second one. And the idea that Johnny Cochran ever succeeded in turning Orenthal James Simpson, of all people, into a martyr for the depredations of the LAPD against black Angelinos will always be amazing to those of us who are old enough to remember when that very same O.J. Simpson was widely reviled in the black community for living in a white neighborhood and being married to a white woman and only hanging out with white dudes and being in commercials for products only white people buy and... Aren't you impressed? I got through this whole segment without saying that Ron and Nicole died of knife cancer, and I'm pretty pleased with myself. Dateline, Washington, Thursday, 13 June. According to a report from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, non-U.S. citizens accounted for 64% of all federal arrests in 2018. In other words, three years before Biden and the enemy saboteur Mayorkas threw open the border for anybody who wants to come, so... One can only imagine how much bigger that percentage is going to get when and if we ever see the numbers for the succeeding years. But wait, I hear you say. My elected leaders and, and the people on the TV are always telling me that foreigners commit drastically fewer crimes per capita than citizens do, and only a filthy no-good MAGA extremist would ever suggest otherwise. Well, yeah, they do say that a lot. Oftentimes it seems more like a reflex action than anything, but first of all, it is a demonstrably false claim. I believe the technical term for it is bald-faced lie, and second of all, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference even if it were provably true, because seriously, try to walk me through the logic on that one if you can, and with particular regard to when the argument is applied on behalf of illegal aliens. 
as it often is. Seriously. How do you get from the point A of illegal aliens commit fewer crimes than citizens and lawful immigrants do to the point B of, therefore, we should have open borders forever? Admittedly, I ain't got no fancy book learning, I ain't got no fancy college degree, but I just can't figure out any sort of coherent linear thought process that leads from the one to the other. It's like saying, OJ killed Ron and Nicole, therefore we should get ice cream after dinner. Which is to say, there is no evident relationship between the one thing and the other. It will likely surprise you not at all to learn that that 64% number represents a, a literal 180 degree flipping of that particular script just in this century, at the start of which, in the year 2000, 63% of federal arrests in the United States were of U.S. citizens. Imagine that, which is a pretty good indicator of just how quickly and completely the open borders crowd has changed the demographic makeup of the country, and not in a good way and also a good indicator that they are lying, and they know they are lying when they insist the vast majority of the people they are bringing in are honest, upstanding, hard workers just looking for a better life. Because clearly, a lot of them are, in fact, scumbag criminal reprobates who came here to prey on Americans. Sometimes the numbers don't lie and you can't cook the books to say what you want them to say. Your total pool of federal arrestees doesn't go from 63% U.S. born to 64% foreign in 18 years unless somebody is trying really damned hard to make it that way. Dateline Green Bay, Friday, 14 June. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, America's greatest physician, told a sparsely attended gathering of Wisconsin voters this week that the man she is married to is healthy and wise and works hard every day to make life better for the American people. At which point, the people in the audience looked at each other in great confusion and said, Wait, when did she divorce Joe? <laughs> what do you think? Should we should we use the rim shot machine twice in the same roundup? Yeah, I think we probably should. <laughs> Dr. Jill, whose apparent role in the campaign is to go around saying things Joe should be able to say for himself, but can't because they require stringing more than half a dozen words together, went on to say, quote, Joe isn't one of the most effective presidents of our lives in spite of its age, but because of it. End quote. And I have to say, I totally agree with the first half of that sentence. Joe isn't one of the most effective presidents of our lives. If they cut it off right there, I would sign that memo. And you know, strange as it may seem, I think I might actually be inclined to agree with her overarching thesis as well, because it comports pretty nicely if not on purpose, with what I've been saying all along, that Biden shouldn't get any kind of free pass because his brain has turned into tapioca pudding and he walks into walls and shakes hands with ghosts and says hello to dead people and confuses Egypt with goddamn Mexico. You know why? Because when you ascribe his terrible performance to his advanced age and his diminished mental faculties, you give that age and those faculties entirely more credit than they actually deserve. Because even in the intellectual prime of his life, such as it was, he was still Joe Biden. The guy whose semi-official nickname for 30 plus years was the dumbest guy in the Senate. The guy who Judge Clarence Thomas was looking directly at and talking directly to when he said, quote, from my standpoint as a black American, this is a high tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves, to do for themselves, to have different ideas. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the U.S. Senate, rather than hung from a tree. And Joe Biden just sat there and smirked like it was the funniest thing he ever heard in his life. That is the guy who says you ain't black if you don't vote for him. That's the guy who has the unbelievable gall to accuse his opponent of being the racist in the race. Which is a hell of a bold position to take when you are the last living segregationist senator and the only one ever accused of high-tech lynching by a Supreme Court designate. At least in 1991, he was capable of going to the bathroom by himself rather than on himself. And back to Dr. Jill, America's greatest night nurse. It's hard not to, to notice that when she tries to con people into thinking it's a good idea to return this semi-vegetative cadaver to office for another four years, she uses the, sa the same terms you use when your great-uncle just had his third stroke and he's recovered slightly better than people expected. Oh, he's so sharp, he's so energetic, I can barely keep up with him! Now let's be honest here, nobody says that about another person who actually means those words. Those words are a polite way of saying, yeah, we all know Grandpa is going home to Jesus soon. It's just nice that he is semi-lucid for a little bit longer. 
And hey, if that's what you're looking for in your commander in chief, all I can say is please burn your voter registration card and never attempt to participate in another election ever again. And the rest of us will prosper immeasurably from your absence and your example. Please do make a note of it. And here is the part that you all eagerly look forward to when the roundup ends. And I stop talking. That's the week that was. May it rest in peace. And with that, I transfer command to my distinguished colleague, your illustrious co-host, the Fleet Admiral of the Large Furry Hominid Navy, the one and only, your friend and mine, Mr. Caucasian Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs>